Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're starting off a series of conversations about the transition from secondary to higher education with colleagues from our secondary schools and our higher education institutions that are members of the College and University Relations Committee in IB. And so uh, today's topic is how we uh, assess success and serve students of color who are IB students, and with us today, I have Kevin Hudson from Princeton University, Shannon Gundy from the University of Maryland at College Park, Tamara Seiler from Rice University, and Rodney Joyner from Baltimore City College, right next door to us in Baltimore, Maryland. I would like to ask them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what they do on their campuses. Uh, Kevin, can we start with you? Sure. Um, again, my name is Kevin Hudson. I work at Princeton University um, in the office of the provost, specifically with the vice provost of institutional equity and diversity on Princeton's broad commitment to expand access for first gen, low to moderate income students at selective colleges and universities. And so in that work, I have the opportunity to work with a range of um, um, districts and organizations and projects to consider how we can um, bring our resources resources to bear um, to um, support that effort. Shannon? I'm glad to be here. Uh, again, my name is Shannon Gundy. I'm the Executive Director of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. And I oversee the undergraduate admission process for freshmen and transfer students and all of the wealth of things that that entails. Uh, one of the things that, that excites me most about my position at the university, and one of the reasons that I've actually remained at the university as long as I have, is the opportunity that I have to work um, to provide programs that are going to help ensure access for students of color and to ensure that our application review process um, truly understands students of color and what they're bringing to the university and the potential that they have not only to benefit from what we do but to contribute to who we are. Tamara. Greetings from Houston, Texas and Rice University. Um, again, my name is Tamara Seiler and I am Deputy Director of Admission at, um, in the office with a specialty in access, access and inclusion. And, um, which has been an intentional change on our part. For years, I was the coordinator of minority recruitment, and we made a very uh, deliberate change to, to actually um, to talk about access and inclusion, uh, to expand our um, definitions of diversity and, and, and perhaps groups that haven't been as, as represented among our campus environment, and also to sort of talk about um, certainly their admission, but kind of elevate the um, conversation about how those students, um, the type of experiences they have on our campus and what type of relationships that the Office of Admission should deliberately uh, make on campus of the people who will actually be uh, significant in the four years that a student has to be on our campus. Um, so definitely talking about that inclusion and equity conversation as well. Thank you, and Rodney. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Rodney Joyner, uh, Director of College Advising at Baltimore City College, which is the third oldest public high school in the country. Uh, we serve about 1,400 students, about 85% which are African American. We are IB World School, um, full access uh, to IB for all students, so we're an IB for all students, a school. Uh, we also uh, boast about 98, 99% students who are admitted to colleges. Um, so it's something that we're proud of. And we look to try to create opportunities for students to beyond just making it through high school, but making it through college as well. So we're excited to be, I'm excited to be here to be able to share it with the panel. Thank you. So let's jump right into it. So I'm gonna start with a little hot topic that we're all talking about. Should we treat students of color differently in the admissions process? Uh, Please, go ahead. <laughs> to I, I'll start. Um, one of the things that, that I've found most beneficial at the University of Maryland is um, looking at all students um, through, through a lens which allows us the opportunity to consider everything that we can possibly learn about those students. Um, what that does is gives us an opportunity to consider context. It's really important, um, I think, for us to understand that all students don't have the same opportunities. Um, all students don't have the same struggles and challenges that they have to navigate. And as a result of that, all students can't be evaluated um, on, on the 
the same surface without considering all of those things um, and how those things have influenced students. So um, to, to your question, I don't necessarily think that students of color should be treated any differently in the process. I think that the process should include um, a wide variety of things that allows you to consider personal circumstances and opportunities um, for all students and how those things have impacted students. Um, it's important to understand um, that for a school like the University of Maryland, we're looking for um, best students. We're looking for students that are able to um, come to the university, learn and benefit from what we have to offer and be successful in what we have to offer and contribute to the university. Um, but all students are coming from the same place. And what they have to offer and the way that they've been able to achieve can't be evaluated on the same scale. Um, so with a holistic application review, you're able to consider what students had available to them how they chose to take advantage of the opportunities that they had available to them, and then how they performed within the context of those opportunities. So I'll build on that. Um, <clears throat> we have a rich amount of data on a national level about you know, things that would add to the conversation about how the, the um, educational experience can be different for, uh, for students of color, whether that be, you know, we know that in terms of disciplinary practices or certain school rules and certain practices that um, students of color are disproportionately impacted by some of those. Um, we know that there's gatekeeping. Um, there's, there, there are certain um, sort of beliefs that still happen that, um, you know, I still have conversations with students who said that it, they had to fight to get into some advanced courses. So I think, um, you know, we have to think about, um, certainly, we don't admit people to our institutions that we don't think can be successful. That is, that is the bottom line. Um, and, and, and many of us are very fortunate because of our highly selective processes or our, our highly selective pool that, you know, we're going to have plenty of students who can do the work. So that, that conversation has to go beyond who can be successful to who can perhaps contribute to our community in variety of ways. And so I do think that, you know, that's how our conversation is shaped, is really looking at not only what, um, you know, the academic preparation and the academic successes that a student has had, but also what they're going to add to the conversation that's going to elevate the experience for everyone. So yes, I think that in terms of uh, we're not, it, it's hard to say we're treating them differently, but I think we're looking at the appropriate context for all students, and sometimes that means a different context for students of color. Yeah, I'd, I'd say to answer your question directly, no, we don't expect students of color to be treated any differently uh, in the application process, but I will echo uh, what Shannon and Tamara said about looking at the entire student um, in the process and not just, uh, hey, student from Iowa, student from inner city, Chicago or Baltimore, whatever, um, and seeing, hey, these are different aspects to their education that may not be the same. And in that, taking the time, and that's why holistic uh, review is something I love just because it gives us, the students an opportunity to showcase in some areas where they may not be as strong. So now if I can, maybe I, I wrote a fantastic essay but my SATs are maybe just slightly below the median range, that might help. So those kinds of opportunities where, stu where students are considered beyond just what's seen in black and white and really dug into by the admissions committee to really give a student an opportunity. And if a student doesn't, and we tell our students in the office all the time, if you didn't make it, it's okay. We have other choices we can go to, um, but it's not all or nothing. So we try to spread the table pretty wide for students so that even in the event where there is a denial, it's okay. Yeah, I, I think the, the admission process is much broader than the ultimate decision made by a college or university. That's important, their evaluation is important, and everything that was said earlier is vital to the, to the process to make sure that there's equitable evaluation of students. But where we know there's disparity in the type of access that students have to information, to expectations to attend college, um, to rigorous college courses, to the International Baccalaureate program in his classes, as well as other 
um, um, other rigorous course offerings. Um, and that's happening on the K-12 level over and over again. That then impacts the colleges and universities that students of color, that low to moderate income students, not to be confused with students of color. Those are separate populations, um, necess not, um, nece aren't necessarily the same. Um, but that there's disparity that exists in terms of just understanding what's available to them and having the preparation um, to be able to, to, to attend a range of colleges. Additionally, higher ed, uh, my colleagues at various colleges or universities, we have to consider where are we visiting? Where are we communicating mm -hmm. to students that they can consider our colleges and universities? And doing evaluation of what the numbers say about equitable access, um, both in our visits, but also in the course offerings and class participation of, um, of students of color. Well, that's a great segue into my next question, which has to do with expectations. Um, there are loads of expectations on students, on schools, on universities. Can we talk a little bit about the role that expectations play on how students of color make decisions about attending university, where to apply, and, and, and how you think that, that that's a conversation that could be expanded a little more? And uh, why don't we start with Tamara on this one? OK, sure. Um, I mean, I, um, I think when I'm training new staff members on how to evaluate students and how to, to interact with students, I often say <clears throat> they, you have to, you want to actually let the student kind of set the tone for what it is that elevates their college going process. So, you know, certainly could be that some students are concerned about what their experiences will be as a student of color on our campuses. But that shouldn't be your, your expectation going into the interaction. That student may be much more concerned about you know, affordability. That student may be much more concerned about being a member of the LGBTQ community. That student may be much more concerned about what it's going to be like as a New Yorker coming to, you know, Texas. <laughs> and so, uh, and they may have all of the above concerns. So I think, I think that we need to, I think it's, it, you know, one of the things on our side is that we need to stop treating students as a monolith. We have to actually look at, and I think that goes all the way down into the whole experience is that you have to listen and react. And I mean, I think, and, and, and then give them what they need at, the, at certain points. I think, uh, and you need to be prepared maybe. I mean, I, I think that we fill, fill our roles as admission officers, but again, that's why we're kind of looking at where do we need to be pulling into other players to help support mm -hmm. these students in terms of this process and really making sure that they have everything that they need to be able to make the best college decision possible. I, I am, I'm still dismayed sometimes by some of the expectations that students say that they have within their own environments. Like, um, you know, I see students who are, for example, bringing really, you know, uh, like exceptional testing, but then for whatever reason, there's a disconnect in the classroom. And that there's not necessarily this, you know, there's not anybody advocating or maybe pushing that student to say, what is going on? Because you're m capable of much better. I think there are certain things that, that you know, that students of color don't get the attention that you would not do that with a student who was not from that background. And that you would say, you would, you would have that conversation. I think they shouldn't expect that these students are gonna get into, um, you know, oh, you're automatically gonna get in because you have this test score. You're automatically going to do that. I, I, want to, I want them to have, you know, strong expectations of all of their students and be able to address that and be concerned enough to address it. Um, so I, I'm going to stop there because I mean this could go in any number of directions um, because I just think uh, but I think that I think I want people to invest in having the students have the best expectations of themselves and I think that that doesn't happen sometimes for students of color in our educational environments. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to tag on uh, next. Um, I think our students have, especially at, I would say it in my school, um, where we set the expectations pretty high. Um, we're a college prep school, you come in as an eighth grader to set your schedule, we're talking college from day one. You're going to college, you're going to college. And that's how I went to college. I was a first generation student. I wanted to go to college. My parents didn't know how to do it, neither did I. But someone told me, you're going to college. So I said, okay, I'm going. And we have to perpetuate that, and we do, 
um, at our school to let students know that this is the expectation. You're to go to college, you're gonna graduate from college. Our biggest sort of opponent, or I guess not even opponent, just <sighs> source of strife is sometimes that's not echoed at home. Um, where many times students get that opinion of themselves that my expectation is to maybe do better or okay, hey, I graduated from high school, that's good enough, I'm the first person to do that in my family. So this college thing, I'm not quite sure about. Um, so many times we have to really fight. We've developed a, a summer melt team at my school because many times we notice that once they graduate, pay your deposit, did your housing, something happens along the way during the summer where somebody convinces you said, you don't really wanna do that, you don't wanna leave us. So now the expectation of going to college diminishes and diminishes to the point where sometimes some students say, well, I'm gonna just take a semester off and stay at home. So the expectation for us is to try to stay with them as long as possible so we can get them in the door, knowing that once they get in the door, they can do the work and making sure the colleges have the support systems in place to be able to keep their expectations high. Um, so it's for us, it's, it's sort of a dual role we're playing here, not only as educators, but also as encouragers, parents, <laughs> all kinds of roles we're playing just to make sure the students can have the access to that higher education, which we know is gonna take them far beyond what the job at the local convenience store is gonna do for them. So I wanna follow that up actually, because um, you mentioned seeking out the support and having the support through the summer melt, but, but uh, you also alluded to the fact that seeking out the resources that may be available on campus to support them. And so uh, I would love to hear from our three uh, university side colleagues as to the types of resources that students and families should be looking for when they're looking at uh, the college selection process. And, and why don't we start with Shannon and then move to the, to the sides. When I have conversations with, with students and parents and even counselors who are working on behalf of, of students who are trying to, to navigate this process, um, one of the things that I try to help them understand um, is that you, you should be looking for a place that cares about those things, first of all. Um, you know, schools that are simply looking to enhance the numbers of students on their campus that are students of color, but really don't understand the fact that students are bringing needs with them and need to be supported through the process. Um, even students that are coming from, from um, backgrounds where they may have privilege, uh, mm -hmm. backgrounds where they've had strong academic preparation, um, when um, students are coming into the college arena, uh, particularly students who may be first generation college students or even second generation college students, they need to be at a place that understands that they have particular needs and is working to meet those needs. Um, for, for many places that starts with the admissions office, um, one of the things that, that I feel sort of responsible for is not just you know recruiting and admitting students, but handing them off to people on campus that I know are going to help guide them and help them find the resources that they need. Uh, it's important that, that students of color, I think, find a person who they feel that they can pick up the phone and call. The person may not have the answer, but the person should be someone who, who is willing to listen and willing to help guide the students to find the right person to address the question. Um, beyond that, I think it's encouraging students to feel comfortable asking questions. Um, you know, part of the learning process is asking. And I think particularly within populations of students of color, um, sometimes there, there's a fear of being judged. If you're asking questions, people mm -hmm. feel, like other, everybody else knows the answer to this question, I should know the answer as well. Um, and trying to help educate our students that asking questions is a sign of strength, it's a sign of your intelligence and your desire to learn, and that's how you learn information. Uh, but I think the bottom line is really going someplace that cares about those things and can help um, students navigate um, those pathways that are, aren't always quite so easy. So I, I think it's important that students evaluate colleges and universities as much as they may be evaluated in the admissions process. And so when I say that, giving them tools so that they can do that evaluation as they ask questions. Um, a lot of times students kind of walk around campus, see how they feel. That's all amazing. But do students like you graduate from that college or university? Um, and it doesn't mean you, you don't attend the university if, if there's some question marks there, but it means you know what questions to ask to find the support 
supports that you may need at that college or university and not make assumptions. So uh, there's a great resource, um, um, that, um, collegeresults.org, that provides a breakdown of graduation rates by, uh, by ethnic background and gender that can be a resource for students. Um, so that they can, they can look at what the resources are, what the challenges are that a school may have. But then when they visit a college or university, actually finding that cultural center, if that's something that's of importance to them. It may not be. For them, it may be that, um, that they really want to be involved in the arts and that the school really provide a community that's supportive of students engaged in the arts um, or in service or in entrepreneurship, whatever it may be. Um, that's important to them because we don't want to make assumptions based on background. They need to evaluate and find out if those resources are available. Um, and as was just stated, just the importance of asking questions. Um, and it may not be it may not um, be a matter of you going to visit the school that you're most interested in, but starting a process early on to go visit colleges and universities to find out the types of supports that colleges and that different colleges and universities provide. So you can understand the language even in your local community so that if you go a little further out you know what types of things you may be looking for and what language to use. You want to add something tomorrow? Sure I, I think um, I'm at the risk of sounding controversial um, I think you know unless you're a, a historically black college or university or Hispanic serving institution or something like that we I think one of the first steps that we on our side have to remember is that we are often bringing students into a community that wasn't built for their success. Mm -hmm. It was not focused on them when it was created. So a lot of times what we're doing is hopefully listening to those students and breaking down the barriers that we may think don't exist at our college, but, but you constantly find them. Um, you know, when you, it's almost like an onion. When you peel back one layer, you find another layer. And so, um, so it's been, I, I mean, I think our students are, in, I think creating an environment, and those students should look for an environment that even if the thing, even if things aren't perfect, somebody's willing to listen to you, and somebody's willing to say, "Okay, well, let's see how we can make a more perfect place for you." Um, so you know, if it, we have, we can't say that everything is satisfied by admission and financial aid. And it's like there's a lot of different things that students need. Even financial aid itself, you know, doesn't even. Uh, one of the things we've discovered, it didn't kick in until students. You know, apply. I mean, I actually arrive on campus when they matriculate. And so what about the student who is, you know, if we want more low income students on our campus, the reality of a student who cannot get from where they are to your campus. And so, I, and so what do you do about that? So I think that, you know, I think, I think, you know, bottom line, I think they need to be looking for places that are willing to have those tough discussions and do something about it. Well, so that kind of leads me to the conversation about IB and, uh, and what IB uh, means for students from these populations and, and how it can be an asset or help them in this process and what it means to you as educators on either side of the desk when you're working with these students. I'll start with that. Um, for me, IB does a couple of things for our students. One, it gives our students hope that they can make it, that they can do the most rigorous curriculum out there, that they can be successful at it, that they can learn how to persevere. Um, but also, it's an equalizer for us. This is really a huge equalizer, knowing that you're coming from inner city Baltimore, which has its own perception uh, out in the world uh, via social media, regular television, whatever. Everyone's image of Baltimore is like, oh, you okay? You know, <laughs> you live there, you live in the city, you know, that kind of thing, you know? But, if, and our kids are perceived that way, unfortunately. So coming from an, an urban school um, and says, hey, I'm an IB diploma candidate. And people usually get like, you know, wait a minute, what? And now it becomes an equalizer. Now I can't, tr I can't throw on you the same things I'm thinking about or I've seen on television, because you might be different. You gotta be different because you've done the IB, and I know somebody over here who's done the IB doesn't look anything like you, doesn't sound anything like you, but now you've got the same coursework, you've done the same level of, of work and competencies, so you're now, okay, I have to treat you, I gotta treat you equal because guess what? 
you're on the same plane. Uh, and I think for us, the IB has done a tremendous job, even for our students who are not full diploma students. Um, they come back and tell us stories of how great college has been academically, that they were able to be successful in the classroom, able to contribute, I think somebody said earlier, to the college community and not just go there and take classes and join a fraternity or sorority, but really contribute to the college community. And that's what we really preach, global mindedness and you know, knowing who you are through the uh, learner profile and having students to kind of embrace that. And the IB has given us that sort of avenue to be able to reach students at that level so they can now feel comfortable with who they are. And as they venture out into the, uh, the higher education world, they're prepared. They're prepared and they co they're confident. For me, that's the, p the big piece. I think we, we prepare them well academically, but our secondary role is to really build confidence in them so they can feel like they can really make it all the way through. And we get story after story about how they've matriculated through and graduated and gone on doing great things. So we're, that's, that's really exciting. So we're really happy to have IB um, as sort of the cornerstone of our curriculum, yeah. I think IB for a student that's authentically engaged um, in IB, um, and, and um, it, it gives them an opportunity to develop as as 21st the, the skills necessary to be 21st century leaders, um, and and to really thrive on a college campus, um, to to be able to think critically, um, um, think about how to solve problems, how um, different subjects relate to one another, um, and and to be inquisitive, um, you know is these attributes that isn't necessarily about content, it's about who they are as people and how they operate in the world that will allow them to be leaders and be influencers um, and contribute to the world. It's not necessarily that they know the content, although by all means, hopefully they're getting that and they will get that. It's how they develop as people. Um, I think that's, the strengths of, that's one of the strengths of IB. One of the things that excites me most about IB is that you know, I've learned in, in my, my many years of experience that students have the tendency to rise to the level of expectation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you present them with. Mm -hmm. And IB presents a higher level of expectation. And I think students naturally try to rise to that level of expectation. When we're talking about students of color, we are not talking about students who aren't smart. We're not talking about students who aren't driven. We're not talking about students who aren't able to do the work, we're talking about students for whom the expectation hasn't been placed, mm. um, for people who assume that students may not be able to do that work. IB takes that away. IB puts smart students who are talented and able to be successful in an environment where that's expected of them and helps them to achieve that. I'm not more sure how much more I could add, but I think what IB does is, you know, everybody says tap into your superpower. I think it allows you to tap into your intellectual superpower. And I think, you know, in a, in a variety of ways, because when we evaluate applicants, we're certainly looking for as sort of their um, academic alignment, their intellectual vitality, but we're also looking at their impact. And I think what, it, what this does is it provides students sometimes with a very, um, direct path to tap into their passions and see how their passions can become action and see how that action be can become leadership. And I think that that's sort of what the learner profile is designed to do in addition to providing strong academic coursework, but to teach them how to be advocates for their educational journey, to teach them how to, to really lead in terms of their, to be self-directed in that type of thing, and to find out that they actually can have a voice. And I think that, that voice and that confidence, that's the biggest thing that's going to serve you when coming into a school environment, is to be able to advocate for yourself and to not be afraid of having those conversations, because I think that's the other thing that facilitate, that IB facilitates, is that ongoing conversation with a mentor or with somebody that is going to have to, um, it's not just going to be somebody in the classroom, but somebody outside of the classroom that's going to be able to help you direct your learning. So I think that, that um, so yeah, I mean, I think that in itself, if you can tap into that superpower, you're already, you know, miles ahead <laughs> when you get to a college campus. So it's interesting, Rodney, because you mentioned that you're an IB for all school, and, and it's a term that we use in IB world to refer to uh, all of the students are taking at least a couple of IB be courses in a school and many of them are encouraged to do the diploma um, but that's not really 
the current tendency. We have a lot of uh, a lot of schools where there the IB cohort is it's is a small cohort within a school. Uh, demographically, it may not look like the rest of the school. Um, we have primary years program, it's a whole school program. We have a middle years program, they're whole school programs. But once we get into the diploma and the career related program, we have a sort of um, really tightening of, of the group that's, that's allowed in there. I mean, we, we, we are to some extent talking about some gatekeeping at that level. Uh, what would you say to schools, educators, parents about the IB for all concept and how that uh, contributes to student upward mobility, as it were. Well, I'll, I'm just thinking about our journey because we started off with the gatekeeping, a small group, pretty homogeneous, um, and then we kind of just stopped for a second and said, "Wait a minute, this isn't right. Don't we expect all of our students to be able to do this?" And for us, it, it started at the level of expectation. That do we really expect all of our students to do this? If so, take away all the applications, all the extra essays, all the recommendations, all the GPA number requirements and all that. We're taking all that away. We're going to just open the doors up and say, hey, if you want to do it, by gosh, you have an opportunity, you can do it. So for us, going through that model, um, I think it began with us of taking the expectation across the board that, guess what, you can do it. I know you came from the worst part of the city, but you're here, you made it to this high school, and we're a magnet school, so you have to apply and all that stuff, which means you have the ability to do it. So now we expect you to do it. And I think Shannon mentioned that earlier, this raising that level of expectation and belief, not just at the administrative level, but at the faculty level, where they're teaching the students, because. We still encounter some of that in our classrooms today where don't, everyone can't quite do this. Or this, this four, that's good enough for you. Mm -hmm. You did well. And I'm like, no, four is not good. You know, my, my kid graduated, he was not a full diploma student, but you know, we had a teacher at one time said, hey, you know, he's doing well in my class. I said, oh, this is great. I said, oh, this is like a four or three or something. I'm like, that's not well, you know? It's, that, it's believing that this kid can get a six or seven. Mm -hmm. You gotta believe that. And if, if the school doesn't believe that, it's gonna be a tough road to hoe because they've gotta, oh, what about this though? We wanna have the best students in there, but everyone's the best student, if you believe it. And I think that's where it starts for us. I, th I think the, the conversation about access is, is sort of one dimensional. Um, and, you know, access is, is, is great and I think access is the right thing to do. You know, providing access to all students who, who, who should be able to allow to achieve at the best of their ability. Um, that's just the right thing to do. But beyond that, I think we miss the conversation that ensuring access, first of all, as educators, is something that, that you should be committed to doing. Um, as an educator, you shouldn't be picking and choosing the students that you're choosing to educate. Education is for all. Um, however, the other, the, the other piece of the, the puzzle is that students learn better. The educational outcomes are stronger when you're putting students in environments where diversity is important and diversity happens. All kinds of diversity contribute to the learning outcomes for all students. And I think that you know, if we're trying to ensure that our students are getting the best possible education, diversity has to be considered a part of that. I think the, the K-12 schools uh, um, may also want to be reflective as well around, um, you know, looking at the programs that they have and who's sitting in that classroom. Uh, what's the demographic? Is it representative of the school? Why isn't it? And actually, actually asking those hard questions um, and the expectations that they have of their, their young people. We don't often like to use words like love and education, but there is something about treating a, a student, a child that you're working with as you would your own. And so often you find that um, that's not always the case, that educators make the same decisions about the young people they work with as they would their own child or family and have the same expectation. And if you're not doing that, that's something you need to be reflective about. Additionally, what are the supports you're providing 
in that program to be able to support all students with different, with varying degrees of preparation. Are you teaching or are you just teaching students who are the best prepared? And that's not teaching. And so being really reflective and thoughtful about the supports you provide. And, and, and I'll take this uh, you know, from, a, from a higher ed perspective. Higher ed institutions are ha having to be reflective about as we um, enroll students who are first gen, low to moderate income, who may not have been quite as prepared to take on, tackle some of our coursework. Um, are we, are we um, doing the, uh, providing them with the proper supports so that they can engage the range of coursework? It's not remediation. Remediation is when you just, you know, you've been, uh, you've, you've tried stuff and you've been presented it well and you just, you just don't get it, you need to continue it. No, these students often just have not been presented with the information and need to, prov need to be provided support and introduction that on the higher ed side, we've, we've said, no, if you don't have this level of preparation, then you're not quite smart or ready enough. That's about the, the, the problems within higher ed and within K-12, not about those young people. And so there's a need for us to do better about loving and supporting the young people that are in our charge. So I think we could continue this conversation for several hours, but, uh, but our time is coming to an end. And so I would like to ask if, if each of you would like to just give a, a closing remark uh, on, on the subject that we've been talking about, just kind of a final thought, and then we'll, we'll say goodbye to our audience. <laughs> Sure, I'll start. Why not? Why not? Right? We'll go right down the line. Yeah. Then. Right. Um, I guess my final thoughts are: um, I look forward to. Um, I guess I'm going to add this: the use of technology, um, as it has become a dominant part of our culture, that it's incorporated in IB uh, more so because our students. That's pretty much all they do. Um, so we're trying to find ways, even at our school, to incorporate more technology in their teaching and learning. But because we know it's not only just the social media stuff on Instagram and stuff, but it's really the way they're starting to learn. And we've got to really start thinking about how we can address that um, at an educational level. Because for years, education, put that phone away, put that phone away. Don't, but now that's all you have is your phone or your tablet and you're using it constantly. And we as a, we have adults, we do the same thing. So um, I think this is the use of technology and IB, I think I'm looking forward to seeing how that's gonna sort of evolve over the years. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to be part of this group and part of these type of conversations as we, as we um, I think for those of us on the university side and certainly those who have to, um, you know, manage an admissions process that uh, will not allow as many people as you would like through the aperture <laughs> to, to, to actually fit. Um, but I think um, it's just, n it's always good to be able to be part of conversations that will uh, challenge the way you think about your processes and about the communities that you provide and about the opportunities you may be missing out on if you're, if you're not really aware of all of the conversations. And then from the student side of thing, I, I'm, I'm excited uh, to, to hear about more students being, uh, having access to things like IB for All because I just think about like the type of conversations that would be missed out in a classroom structure if you're not bringing more voices mm -hmm. to the table. Um, um, you know, certain subject areas that if you're really wanting students to elevate their understanding, that it needs to be looked at from a cross-cultural perspective. It needs to be looked at from a, uh, a cross, um, uh, you know, s s uh, socioeconomic status perspective. I mean, it, you know, what are we missing out on when we don't let those students come to the table and have those conversations? And I am constantly, I mean, you know, just, amazed by what some students are able to do with so little with so many barriers in front of them and I don't and I'm hopeful that access to challenging courses doesn't become yet another barrier for them so I think you know if we can lose that barrier you know at least that's one thing we can do every time
time I have a conversation like this, I, I sort of approach it with, with caution. Um, I think sometimes if people are sort of listening at a, at a very high level and not really paying attention to the level of conversation, you sort of paint with a wide brush stroke and you make assumptions about students and who they are and what we're trying to convey. And I, I want to make sure that we walk away from this with the understanding that um, we are not talking about, as you said, we're not talking about remediation. Um, we're not talking about a monolithic population of students. We're talking about individuals. And it's our responsibility to meet those individuals where they are. Sometimes they have barriers. Sometimes they don't have barriers. Sometimes we're placing barriers for them. Um, but I want to make sure that we understand that our responsibility is, is to do as we do with every other student. Meet them where they are and help move them forward. I just want to make sure that people are very careful in how they think about these conversations and don't just think we're talking about lowering standards in order to be able to accommodate students of color. That's not what this is about. Yeah. Um, and I think as we as we think about working with students of color, traditionally underrepresented students, um, low socioeconomic, uh, students from lower socioeconomic um, backgrounds, uh, making sure that we actually are using data in schools and in higher ed to, um, um, to bridge the gaps, um, the equity gaps that exist. Um, and not what we feel and what we think, but actually using data um, and then um, using the lessons from that data to address the challenges that exist. Because we know they exist, we know they're out there, but too often people are just really not aware of how that plays a role within their own community. And so I think that's that's important. And, you know, as I said earlier, put a little love in it. Like, I like they're your own children um, in the work that you're doing. I think that's important. Well, I want to thank you all for a very thought-provoking conversation and, uh, and uh, very inspirational. And I think that uh, hopefully we can come back to this table and continue the conversation at a future time. I want to say thank you to Kevin, Shannon, Tamara, and Rodney for joining us today, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's a wrap. That was great, guys. Yeah.